Hello and welcome. My name is Daisha Martin. And I'm Jolene McPherson. <laughs> and we are both members of the African American Student Union here at the GSD, as well as the co-chairs for tonight's and this weekend's events. It is our honor and privilege to welcome you to the third biannual Black and Design Conference titled Black Futurism, Creating a More Equitable Future. Woo! <laughs> As we begin our conference, we want to take a moment to share a few remarks with you about the history of Black and Design and this year's theme. But before we do so, we would like to invite the spirit of our ancestors to join us into this space. We honor them for their hard work in fighting for our human and civil rights, our voices to be heard, and our bodies to be seen. To be able to sit in these spaces like this and to connect with all of you. For this, we are eternally grateful. The Black and Design Conference began in 2015 to begin a legacy of recognizing the contributions of the African diaspora to the design field, and to promote discourse around the agency of the design profession, and to dismantle the institutional barriers that affect our community. In 2017, the legacy continued. It continued to build around conversations of social justice and coalition building. This year, the Black and Design Conference, Black Futurism, Creating a More Equitable Future, explores pathways to liberation through the design lens considering the historical past and present structural oppression in black and brown communities, both locally and internationally. Our goal is that this conference will demonstrate how designers, creatives, organizers, educators, you, me, us, will continue to build and reimagine a more sustainable and equitable future for black and brown bodies. We hope that during this weekend, you stay fully engaged, aware, and vulnerable to really plan and think about how you can begin to reimagine the future to tap into your inner potential and power to create a better life for the future you and for the future generations to come. At this time, I would like to give a special thank you to our amazing team of organizers, Asesua, Aliyah, Khalil, Rania, Tierra, Lair. <laughs> thank you to Paige, Erica, Jerry, Naisha, Tony, and Stephen Gray for their support and words of encouragement. Thank you to our professors and faculty members, and thank you to our dean. This conference would not be possible without your continued support. Black and Design continues to have a positive impact at the GSD and the surrounding community. As always, we have worked very closely with our dean and we look forward to building this legacy with you in the future. Please join me in welcoming Dean Sarah Whiting, Dean and Joseph Lewis Sarah, Professor of Architecture, Sarah Whiting. Good evening. So it's a real pleasure to be here this evening to help you kick off the third Black and Design Conference here at the GSD. Uh, I clearly don't need to tell this audience that Black and Design may only be a three-year-old, but its impact has been way outscaled for a toddler. Imagine what it'll be when it learns how to drive. I wasn't here at the GSD when Black and Design held its first two conferences, but I can assure you that I heard about them. The world was and is paying attention. This has and continues to be an exciting and urgent gathering, both for the GSD and for design writ large. I want to thank the African American Student Union for the important work that they do throughout the year. And tonight, I want to especially thank the 2019 organizing team, although the women ahead of me took the, took the thunder from my thanks. But still, if, if those of you who were part of the organizing team could please stand for uh, what I thought was going to be the first of many thanks, but is now the second. So the Black and Design Conference organizers, Jolene McPherson, Daisha Martin, Tierra Sachbell, Aliloy Evanson, Asisu Ikpifan, Rania Kamala, and Khalil Kaba. Thank you. Thank you. I also want to thank all the speakers for coming to this event. It's an incredibly smart lineup. 
It promises to be a very dynamic set of panels and conversations that will ripple across the rows of Piper, out to the trays of Gund, through Cambridge to reach the world beyond. A final thanks on my part to Pierce Freelon for agreeing to be this conference's keynote speaker. Michelle Wilkinson, current Loeb Fellow and Curator of, the architecture of, curator of Architecture and Design at the National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, shared with me the link to the video of the celebration of life that took place just a week ago for Pierce's father, Phil Freelon. And I speak for the entire GSD in saying that Phil was taken from the world far too young, and we're very grateful for the impact that he had. Pierce, at that event, may well have been overshadowed by the next generation of freelons. I will say, if you watch the video, the grandkids were phenomenal. Uh, but I want to thank you for coming and to committing to this event uh, so soon after such a significant one for your family. So we're in the 21st century. Um, may, maybe some of you were born in this century, but for me, the 21st century was sort of meant to be the age of the Jetsons. You know, at this point, we should be flying around, and maybe those Amazon drones will get us there at some point. But, but really, this was sort of meant. The 21st century still had such an impact on on us growing up in the in the 70s and 80s. And I'm giving away my age. Still, we're, we're, we're in a, a really difficult world. So this is a, a century that was meant to be a century of such promise, of such accessibility, of such opportunity for everyone. And it's, a, it's actually a difficult moment. The world we live in today is not the easiest. There's a climate crisis. There's a housing crisis. There are nonstop Twitter crises coming out of DC. And still, 50 years after civil rights, there are crises of equity and of race. I really appreciate the theme of this year's conference of, of uh, black futurisms, of looking to the future, uh, because we actually can't afford not to. So we're, we're at a moment in a world that should, I think we have the power to bring it to a world of opportunity. Uh, and frankly, we have the obligation to. So the future is the only thing that we can change. Uh, and we all have to do it together. So I am super excited about this year's conference, and I really appreciate the work that you all are going to take in, in uh, laying out a very colorful, uh, dynamic future. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Jolene McPherson, who is a second year MLA student here at the school and has done a fantastic job. The two of you have done a great job organizing this. Up to you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that was a great segue into my opening remarks and introduction for Pierce Freelon. So, this weekend we'll be uncovering a wide range of topics under the theme of black futurism. We hope to work together to uncover this meaning further, but while we're here, we'd like to share a poem that perhaps might project us forward in thinking. Is it possible to be pro-black and pro-America? It seems that in every effort we try to advocate for our rights, we are told to sit down, stop being ungrateful, and consequentially, that our rights are not in line with America. Seemingly so, America and her ideals were not created for women, blacks, minorities, or differences. We have been amended into, added onto, reconsidered, adjusted as an afterthought, and semicolon othered. Perhaps this is the most painful conclusion, that being pro-black and pro-America are inherently in conflict. Perhaps this is why it's so painful to know that Barack poured his soul into the country and people still claim it wasn't enough for either side. But perhaps I've made a mistake in my question. The biggest lesson I learned in my first year at the GSD is that by only understanding relationships and polar position, binaries, we greatly miss the complexity, subtleties, opportunities, and imagination that rest in between. This liminal space is neither black nor white, us versus them, me against you. It's a spectrum ranging and relational tension, opening up an alternative universe of existence, of being, of connecting with others, of defining ourselves. 
I find most black artists project themselves in the spectrum of color, challenging the confines and infrastructure set against them. The spectrum is where we must operate for change. We have the power to employ our creative imaginations, ideas, and dreams to foster more inclusivity, diversity, and commitment to others. For us, creativity embodies this freedom to further challenge and investigate our own identities. It opens a world of opportunities that are not limiting or discouraging, but fulfilling in the sense that in helping others, we create community and growth. Can we, push, can we use this conference to challenge our minds and push further to examine the spectrum of relationships, open doors to include unheard voices and new perspectives in the creative process? It cannot be handed to us in a syllabus from a professor, but requires constant engagement, commitment, and conversation. So back to my question, is it possible to be pro-black and pro-America? Well, perhaps America too needs redefining. Perhaps I've made a mistake. Perhaps I've tainted this vision of America. You see, America is not a boundary, a territory, or a line that creates a trace on a piece of paper. America is not a singular group, definition, or limitation. It is the beginning, not end. We are not defined by people who created it, but by the people who continue to create it. <laughs> It seems by expanding these definitions, the very definition of being pro-black is being a true American. I know it, even as we say it, it still feels distant, but I promise this isn't some political propaganda. We hope this weekend we will explore what is needed in order to create a more equitable future. Let's investigate that through the lens of futurism. Who better than to continue this conversation than Pierce Freelon? <laughs> <laughs> Pierce is a pioneer in his community. He is a professor, director, musician, Emmy Award winning producer, and millennial politician who is running for North Carolina State Senate. <laughs> He is the founder of Black Space, a digital makerspace in Durham where young people learn about music, film, and coding. He is a writer, composer, and co-director of an animated series called History of White People in America, which premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival back to back in 2018 and 2019. He is a co-founder of Beat Making Lab, a PBS web series, which won Best Video Essay for its episode of Heartbeats of Fiji at the 2015 Daytime Emmy Awards. Born and raised in Durham, Pierce ran for mayor in 2017 on a platform of community, growth, youth, and love. Pierce earned a BA in African and African American Studies at UNC Chapel Hill and an MA in Pan-African Studies at Syracuse University. He has taught music, political science, and African American Studies both at UNC Chapel Hill and North Carolina Central University. Pierce lives in Durham with his wife of 11 years and their two children. Please join me in welcoming Pierce Freelon. Hello? Hey, y'all. <laughs> it's cold in here. <laughs> um, who wrote that poem? You wrote that poem? Yo, that poem, that poem, no. That poem, no. You didn't say, I, that was great. I love the poem. Um, it made me think of uh, that quote from, um, what was the brother's name? Frederick Douglass. What is the 4th of July to the Negro? It's a good question. Um, ooh, my slides are up. Okay. Uh, so thank you so much for inviting me here. Um, just hearing the introductions and the context for this beautiful conference, uh, I'm, I'm honored to be uh, a part of it and to kick things off. And I think every, uh, there's a lot of synergy with what I'm going to talk about with, with, uh, with what we're going to be doing over the next two days. So I'm appreciative, appreciative of that. Um, we're going to start off in West Africa, uh, Sankofa, the secret to time travel. 
We're going to get into some, some time travel. Y'all ready to go? Yeah. All right. Um, so Sankofa is, is a word and a concept that comes from the Akan people of Ghana. Uh, it means the literal meaning in tree is go back and fetch it. Sankofa, go get it. Um, but the, uh, I guess if, if we're to talk about its meaning, uh, the way that, that the idea and the concept is used and, and has developed, it really means y you need to look back to your past in order to understand your future. And uh, we're going to talk about that in the context of time travel a little bit today. So when we opened up uh, with acknowledging and appreciating the ancestors, I thought that was really uh, a beautiful and an appropriate place to start. And uh, for me, um, we're going to talk about some Afrofuturists and some uh, black pioneers today, including my dad, uh, who is now one of the ancestors. And that is a, a privileged place to be. Um, and along with Frederick Douglass and uh, Harriet Tubman, uh, who I'll, I'll talk about in a bit as well. I was just, as y'all were talking, you, you were talking, I was just thinking so much about Harriet Tubman. Uh, you know, when I think about what a fu futurist is, what an Afrofuturist is, Harriet Tubman is the quintessential Afrofuturist. She just lived in a world in a circumstance where she could see and envision a different future, and then she put in the work to manifest that future. Ooh wee, y'all. That's, that's Afrofuturism right there. I get excited just thinking about how courageous she was and just how incredibly dope and creative and, and, and bold uh, and thoughtful and uh, w what a great legacy she's left us. In fact, um, if you go to the Smithsonian Museum of African American uh, History and Culture on the first floor, they actually have Harriet Tubman's shawl. Yes, yes, shawl. <laughs> It's there. Nat Turner's Bible is down there. There are so many wonderful uh, relics in that building that my dad played an important part in designing, and uh, and we're going to talk about that. But so uh, Sankofa again, the Ashanti people, the Akan people of West Africa of Ghana, go back and fetch it. You need to look back to your past in order to uh, uh, to move forward. And you see that here in in the shape of this bird. The bird is moving forward, but it's looking backward, which is. Exactly exactly what we need to be doing as we move forward in uh, movement work, in uh, social justice work, in creative work. We need to make sure that we're entrenched in, in the, uh, the robes of our ancestors as we uh, move into this work. Also, you'll notice that the bird in some depictions, Sankofa has an egg in its mouth, which represents the babies, the children, the future. So, and you'll notice that, that that egg is also being nurtured in the past while we're moving forward to the future. So a lot of the work that I do with black space, mentoring black and brown youth, uh, youth of African descent, um, <clears throat> That is in the legacy uh, of Sankofa, and that is also the secret to time travel, as we'll talk about in a minute. Okay, so um, this quote uh, really resonates with me. Again, we're going to evoke another powerful ancestor, Marcus Garvey. A people without knowledge of their history is like a tree without roots. I don't know about y'all, but I grew up <clears throat> really just kind of nerdy. Anyone else? Just me? Okay. See some nerds in there? All right. Uh, for me, that was not just, uh, you know, that was comic books, that was anime, that was video games. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I, you ever notice how, like, sometimes a really swole superhero like the Hulk will just take a tree and just rip it out the ground. They could toss it around. Um, I don't know if any of y'all ever tried that, you know, just <laughs> I was that kid that would grab the tree and try to see what I could do with it. The tree ain't going nowhere. And the reason is because the tree got roots. And those roots run deep into the ground. It doesn't matter uh, you know, if, if, those, if that tree is rooted, it could be gale force, hurricane winds, it's not going to move. And what Marcus Garvey is suggesting here is that uh, our history is the, are, are those roots. Our history is in those roots. 
Um, and uh, a people without knowledge of their history is like a tree without roots. You, you have a storm without roots, that tree is going to fall over. Um, but it will be grounded, and we also need to be grounded in our history and in the legacies of our ancestors. So important, so powerful. And um, I don't know, I, I'm going to freestyle a little bit. I'm an artist. I like to improvise. Um, I'm thinking right now about um, LeVar Burton also as, a, as a, a, someone who really uh, uh, epitomizes what Sankofa is all about. First of all, you know, I thought about it when I said Roots. I said, oh, Roots, that's the Alex Haley book. <laughs> and I said, oh, Kunta Kente, that's LeVar Burton. But you know, LeVar Burton was also an educated black man who was teaching kids how to read with Reading Rainbow, Fireflies in the Sky. I could go twice as high. <laughs> Take a look, it's in a book, Reading Rainbow. Y'all know the theme. All right? And he was in the future. Who was he? Jordy La F Forge. <laughs> Lieutenant Commander with the visor. You know, different abilities, you know, differently abled. Um, so anyway, that was just, that wasn't even in the script. That was off the top. <laughs> Um, but uh, yes, people without knowledge of their history, true without roots. Shouts to uh, Jordy. Now, uh, I'm going to go back to Sankofa here because the other important thing about the Sankofa bird and what it represents, it also represents a different way of looking at time. I think what we're taught in a, in a Eurocentric curriculum that time is linear. There's the past over there, there's the future over there, and the present is in the middle. Um, but what we see here is the shape of a circle. And uh, it, th this represents the, the cyclical nature of time. And there are many uh, African uh, concepts that, that present time not as a linear structure, but as something that is cyclical. And when you see, again, the bird is in the present. It's moving towards the future. Its youth is in the past. You have this cycle. And I think that's a really important uh, tool for, for kind of thinking about uh, how we move forward and why Sankofa is, is such a beautiful, not just a concept, but a symbol. Um, and you know, when I think about cycles, this is another thing my dad kind of taught me. Um, you know, the universe cycles, the universe is kind of shaped in fractal relationship. Uh, fractal, my, my dad used to show me this video when we were kids called The Powers of Ten, uh, where you kind of start with a couple sitting on a blanket and then you go up by a factor of ten. Have anyone, y'all seen the video? Yeah, y'all should Google it. It's really dope. And one of the cool things about The, the Powers of Ten is it kind of reveals the fractal nature of the uni universe. It's, it's that the same relationships that are in the smallest forms are the, uh, the same shape, the same structure as in their biggest forms. Uh, and so you'll notice that, for example, uh, you know, one of the largest forms in our galaxy would be like a solar system, which is a star with, uh, you know, planets moving around it. Our, our Earth has a sphere rotating around it. Um, and then our, our galaxies are black holes with, you know, planets and stars rotating around it. But then also at, at the smallest level, at the atomic level, you have a nucleus with protons and neutrons and electrons are kind of zipping around it. So how is it that we have it at the very most minute, the same structure that we have at the largest? That's what I mean when I say uh, kind of the fractal nature of the universe. And um, I think that this Sankofa form, this cyclical view of time is also a, a reflection of that fractal relationship. And, and it's not, you know, there's, you see these cycles everywhere, even in life. My dad, as I mentioned, just passed away uh, and rejoined the ancestors. But what did you talk about was the shining moment of that service? It was the children, you know, and so, and they have also inherited his legacy of creativity, his, uh, um, you know, there's life and death, creation, destruction, yin and yang, beginning and ending, there's alpha and omega, but those aren't binaries because most of life happens in between those things. And so we exist in the present in between those things, but we need to be rooted in the past as we move forward to the future. I'm not getting too nerdy on y'all, am I? Y'all still with me? Okay. I figured y'all could handle it. Let's go. 
<laughs> All right. Um, so uh, I just want you to kind of keep those concepts in mind, and then I'm going to give you all some real life examples of how we've I've applied this uh, West African wisdom to the organizing work that I do, the creative work that I do, the way that my dad did the same thing. So we're going to bring up an ancestor right now. This is the man himself, uh, Mr. Phil Freelon. Uh, I think this is uh, in the 19. 80s, 1970s, um, you know, young black architect from Philly, moved down to Raleigh, North Carolina to attend the design school at NC State. Um, you know, he was in a field in the United States of America here that was less than 2% black, which after, you know, 40 years has not changed. Architecture is still a, a, a field that is where African Americans are, are not represented um, very well. Uh, and I think that's something that the, we're going to talk more about tomorrow. Perkins and Will and, and others are trying to change that paradigm. Uh, and we still have a lot of work to do. Um, but, you know, in the 70s, when um, my dad was kind of a young um, student, trying to figure out where he sits in this uh, world of architecture. Um, it was Sankofa that, that helped him root back and to look back to his past to understand that though in the 70s and in the 80s of the United States, the, the field of architecture might only be 2% black, but there are some, some folks, as he was doing research, that he could look to to find out that his legacy extends back way back, back into time. All right, that's a Black Street reference, okay. Um, so this is, uh, this is Julian Abel. In his research, he stumbled across the work of Julian Abel. Uh, does anyone recognize the structure uh, in the background there? This is, uh, this is Duke Chapel at Duke University's campus. And uh, uh, yeah, so in kind of digging through, also Julian Abel is also from Philly, so it was important for my dad to find this black architect who, um, you know, at the turn of the century was doing uh, important, influential, powerful work on a campus that he wasn't even allowed to step on as a student. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Julian Abel w was one of those pioneers, though, though you may not see black architects in the forefront, they, they've been doing the work for a long time. And again, Sankofa, you need to look back to your past in order to understand your future. As my dad was dealing with the uh, you know, lack of diversity in the classrooms and in the, in the uh, graduate level courses, doing uh, drafting and architecture um, uh, work, uh, where he felt underrepresented, uh, he needed only look back to Julian Abel to see what underrepresented was really like in the 1920s when he was designing this structure and to see that there was a path for him, there was a lane for him, there was a history and a legacy that he came from. And uh, when my dad finally, hold on, let me show y'all something. When my dad finally, um, you know, started his own architecture firm, the Freelon Group, in 1990. He chose a very intentional, oh, there goes my jacket. He chose a very intentional logo. I should have put this in the slide because most of y'all won't be able to see it. Hold on, I need two hands on this one. Okay, this is my first tattoo, check it out. So this is, uh, <clears throat> this is the first logo of my dad's first company. I will, uh, you know what, you can see it on my Instagram, so. <laughs> <laughs> If y'all on the gram, it's just my first last name, Pierce Freelon. I think maybe six, seven posts ago, I posted uh, like a video of me actually getting this tattoo like a couple weeks ago. But um, this is actually a bird's eye view of a pyramid. If you were to look at a pyramid from above, it would appear as a square. And this, uh, you know, with the shading, this is the apex of the pyramid, slightly off center, like off to the to the left. So it's like an off-center bird's eye view of the pyramid. And I asked my dad, Dad, why'd you, uh, uh, first of all, 
because I'm not like a visual guy, I follow after my mom who's a singer, She's, I'm a musician. I just thought it was some cool lines and triangles, like a barcode or something. I was like, that's pretty cool. But um, you know, now I can't actually unsee the 3D form that's, that's in the tattoo. I said, Dad, why'd you pick a pyramid? Uh, and he said, because, Afri uh, because of the African origins of architecture, math, science, and ma uh, math, science, and architecture have African origins. Um, and then he started telling me about Imhotep and all these ancient African architects. Again, even before Julian Abel, uh, th there's no shortage of black architects in this world. Absolutely no shortage of architects of African descent who have made some of the most lasting monuments thousands of years later. You know, so again, if, if you don't have Sankofa, if you're not able to look back and see yourself reflected in those pyramids, you might mess around and think there's only 2% of us in the field of architecture. Bruh, you have, have you been to the continent? <laughs> like, so, so that's why Sankofa is important. And he can entrench himself in that past and in that history as he moves forward to build his own business by making a pyramid the, uh, the logo for his company in this legacy of Julian Abel and the legacy of Imhotep and the legacy of African people and all the wonderful monuments that we've built um, in this world and in this country. So uh, moving right along. Dad, this is uh, him maybe two or three years ago delivering the Martin Luther King Jr. lecture in this building that was um, designed by a black man at a time, again, I'll say it again because it's worth repeating, at a time when he could not even attend this campus. He's in there making the most beautiful buildings on this campus that he can't even attend. How about that? How about that? Okay, so um, he stands in that legacy, and, and we need to remember that, we need to know that, we need to embrace that, we need to acknowledge that, we need to give thanks for that. Um, and, and acknowledge that there's still work to be done. There's still work to be done to bring more of us into the field, and, and that benefits the field of architecture to have our voices and our perspectives at the table. Thank you for the snap. <laughs> I appreciate it, okay. All right. <clears throat> So, ooh, okay, where, where was I going with this? Let me consult my notes. Uh, huh. Okay, so this is going to lead from a little bit of my dad's journey and how um, being rooted in his ancestors helped kind of define and influence his career as a designer. Um, my dad was also an architect of relationships and one of those most important intimate relationships was as a father. And uh, one of these is a pointer, right? Is that okay? Yeah, there's me. <laughs> That's me with, you see the cheeks? Uh, my sister, my brother. Um, pretty sure my mom is behind the camera in this one. Uh, around the same time as that other photo, you can tell by the mustache. Uh, you know, this was taken around the same time in the, in the early 80s. And um, <clears throat> I want to give you all some lessons that uh, my dad gave me. Um, as uh, I have, uh, you know, again, in a different way, in a different medium, um, moved forward with uh, a kind of Sankofa-oriented uh, grounding in the past while moving towards uh, the future. So we have three lessons, lessons from my father. Um, He's been on my mind, if you couldn't tell. Uh, he passed away on July 9th, and as you mentioned, we just did the celebration of life last weekend. Um, so when I was preparing for this presentation, of all the things I could talk about, I was just like, I'm gonna come talk about my dad. Is that cool with y'all? Can we? Okay, all right. So lessons from my father. There are three uh, here. Um, there were lots, but I, I thought relevant to what we're talking about today with Afrofuturism. Um, there are three here that I want to focus on. Words create worlds, all right? And we'll get into each one in a little more detail. Words create worlds, follow your compass, bloom where you're planted. These are three of the, uh, of the tools, of the lessons, of the technologies that um, Dad blessed us with. Uh, we're going to start with words create worlds. Um, yeah. <laughs> Avery Brooks, Captain Cisco. Um, so, 
Words Create Worlds is, in my mind, it's about acknowledging the power of the things that we say. We can speak things into existence. We can manifest realities. When we say something, we are putting an energy out in the universe. We are asking the universe to respond and to make things happen. That's how powerful we are as human beings, as entities in this world. We can make things happen. So I'm gonna start at the bottom, make it so. That's another Star Trekism for you, all my Trekkies in the building. We can make things happen. And words create worlds. This is a quote I first heard from my sister, uh, Dr. Margaret Brunson. But uh, it's definitely uh, some, the spirit of, of these words is something that I heard from my dad quite a bit. Um, the first thing when I think about words creating worlds is about intention setting. It's important to set intentions. And I think that uh, one of the things that I hope will be happening over the course of these next two days is that each of us are going to think about and, and share some intentions with one another. Because uh, you know, the first step is for you to conjure it in your mind and then to speak it into existence. You could speak it to yourself in the morning, in the mirror every morning. You could speak it to a, a friend or a family member or somebody that you trust that's gonna help you lift that thing into existence. Um, in fact, can, I, can we improvise a little bit one more time? All right, because uh, I was just thinking um, it would be really dope for us to set some intentions and to share those with the people in this room right now. So uh, this was another thing that's kind of off the fly. But uh, yeah, I want to do that. So maybe um, if we could all just take a breath together. And um, when you inhale, I just want you to think about an intention that you want to set. It can be something for today or something for this year or for this lifetime. Um, anything you want. We're going to take a deep breath in and a deep breath out. Uh, and then I want you to find someone in the room, someone you're sitting next to. It could be a cluster of three or four people or just one person around you. And I want you just to share that intention. We're going to speak it out loud and share it with the people around us. Is that cool? All right. So let's go on three. We're going to take a deep breath in. One, two, three. Think about that intention. All right. Now, Turn to someone around you, and we're going to do one minute, because I don't got time for this. <laughs> All right? Share your intentions. Meet somebody, share your intentions. OK. So um, uh, because I didn't budget time for this, I just want to real quick, if, if somebody has an intention that they want to share, if you could just raise your hand, something that you heard, what, what, were, what were maybe three intentions real quick? Anyone? Just, yeah, right here? Oh, oh, in the back, yeah, could you speak up? Her intention is to get people to sign up for digging Du Bois, a 200 mile, 200 mile, Trail from Atlanta to Albany, Georgia. Let's go. Mm. Let's go. I love it. That's a great intention. That's a great intention. I saw I saw a hand here. Yeah. So my intention is to build the Afrofuturist space that's theorized around the elements and principles of hip hop. Let's go. Let's go. We got one, we got maybe these last two? Yeah. You got, you got a speaker for the brothers. So my brother here, Nazir, who's from Trinidad, so shout out to my Caribbean folks. I'm Jamaican too. Mm -hmm. Hey, there you go, there you go. Sorry, I had to do it. Uh, his intention is to ba build sustainable structures in Trinidad, his hometown. That's beautiful. Nice. Nice. That's the last one. Yeah, please. 
Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Little Wing Lee. I'm an interior designer from Brooklyn. Anyone else from Brooklyn? Yeah. Yay! <laughs> uh, my intention is to this year focus on growing black folks in design. Mm. Um, it's an organization I've been working on for a couple years, uh, but this year is to focus my energy, money, and time on building a network of black designers within disciplines and across disciplines. So, nice. And if anyone wants a button, Let's go. I have buttons. Yes. And, <laughs> and, I was, and I was also one of the exhibition designers on NAMAC, uh, working mostly in the history gallery. So. I cool. worked with your dad, so nice. it's a really great honor. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So thank you, everyone, uh, who shared their intentions. And I know there are a lot more in the room. It's so important. It's to set the intention and then speak it. Speak it. And the more you speak it, the more there's people in the room now that are like, oh, I could connect. You know what I mean? It helps you connect dots. It helps, uh, it helps the thing you want to create manifest. And one more thing I, I want to acknowledge. Uh, I love how when you said Trinidad, somebody said, book, 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 book. <laughs> Just my Caribbean brothers and sisters and gender nonconforming folks love to turn up <laughs> whenever, whenever. Their place of origin is mentioned. I love that. Um, so words create worlds. Remember the power of our words. They're so powerful. Um, and also, just a note of caution, it's important to say that uh, because words are so powerful and they create words, when we speak words of negativity, when we speak words of um, you know, self-doubt and of self-deprecation, then those things, too, will become manifest. So be very careful and very intentional and very precious and gentle with ourselves and, and make sure that we're speaking things that we want to create and not just repeating narratives in our head from, you know, from folks that even if those folks are ourselves that, that don't want, that don't always have the best in mind for us. Um, so really important, the power of words. All right. Uh, two, follow your compass. Okay. If you didn't notice, there's a Star Trek theme going on here. <laughs> Uh, Michael Burnham from Star Trek Discovery. Um, great, great show. Um, so uh, the first thing with Follow Your Compass, again, this is a tool, this is a technology that my dad uh, taught me. It's something, uh, especially when I'm needing to make a, a choice that I draw on often. Uh, it's important to know where you're going. Uh, and uh, I added this one and to also to know where you came from. Um, you know, to have a compass doesn't necessarily mean that you uh, are going to follow a specific route on a specific map. Sometimes you set an intention, you don't even know how you're going to get there, but knowing what the destination is going to be will help you decide whether something is a detour or something is right aligned with where you need to be and where you want to go. And so, uh, you know, again, I'll just evoke the spirit, the spirit of Harriet Tubman. You know, she knew that freedom was what she wanted. She knew that that was something she wanted to manifest. And uh, on, a, on the day to day, the, the practice towards building towards freedom um, took different routes, some that she could never anticipate. But, you know, you always are, are moving towards freedom. If you think about the metaphor of a compass, compasses are devices, you know, they show you where north is. They, they, should, they, they tune into the magnetic field of the planet and give you a direction to follow. Um, but if, if you're on a journey, let's say you're on a boat, you know, there's a lot of things that can throw your ship off course. It could be the tides, it could be a storm, it could be a malfunction on the ship itself. Uh, but if you have your compass, then you can always reset after you dust yourself off from whatever adversity, from whatever challenge, and you can know, okay, we need to get back on track. Um, so for me, one of my tools, one of the technologies that I use to tap into my intuition and um, my sense of where I'm supposed to go is, is meditation and quiet reflection. So when we started, before we um, uh, shared our intentions with one another, we did a breath. We did a collective breath together. And breathing is so important. So, so, so very important. It's an involuntary thing that we do. When you breathe with intention, it helps you tap into that intuition. At least it helps me. Um, so I wanted to offer that. Uh, and, and reflection, meditation, prayer, whatever, whatever it, it 
whatever um, tactics you want to use to help center yourself, I think will help you tap into uh, to this very important lesson. Uh, okay, cool. So trust your compass. And then number three, bloom where you're planted. Um, this is one, oh yeah, there's another part to this. Oh yeah, okay, so again, we're talking about fractals. Um, you know, exploding stars, exploding flowers, similar shape, similar form, the fractal nature of the universe. Uh, and also, this is how and why we're all here. There's a pollination that happens at the cosmic level from which all matter is formed in the, the core of a burning star uh, that, that makes up our bodies and everything on this planet. Uh, and likewise, you know, if the bees die, we can't pollinate and spread all that goodness uh, throughout the earth, we'd be in big trouble here. So, um, but bloom where you're planted, um, plant seeds. So when we set an intention, it's like planting a seed. Um, we already talked about roots. The people without knowledge of their history is like a tree without roots. It's important to know your history, but it's also important to be grounded. Uh, for me, um, I was doing a lot of work, a lot of my uh, creative activism work, um, was about planting seeds in different places around the world. When, when we were doing Beat Making Lab, which I'll show you a clip from in a minute, uh, we were planting a lot of seeds. Um, Beat Making Lab was a program where we would build a studio in a community center internationally. The first one we did was in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And um, it was really beautiful. We, we brought a backpack. I have a backpack somewhere, but y'all you can visualize it. We had a backpack with like a laptop, speakers, headphones, software. You know, that, those were the tools in our seed. And we would bring it to a community center. We would teach the kids how to use this equipment. And then we would leave it with them so that they could continue to make music and create and collaborate. Um, <clears throat> so that was very much about planting seeds. For me, the, the next step of that um, because uh, we, we got a deal with PBS to do this work in different countries around the world. So I mentioned the pilot was in the Congo. After that, we went to Panama and then Senegal. We went to Fiji, Ethiopia, um, Kenya, the Dominican Republic, and then Haiti, uh, all over the course of about two to three years. Uh, and that seed planting work was really dope. But when we look back, on the impact that we were having, we found that sometimes in some countries where we were doing this work, um, the seeds that we planted were, were bearing fruit. It was creating, kids were creating music videos and dropping albums and doing music. In some places, it, that wasn't happening. As soon as we left after the two or three week residency, uh, the equipment was just sitting in a closet somewhere because there wasn't folks on the ground that were helping nurture that seed. Um, so for me, Bloom Where You're Planted, uh, which was advice that my dad gave me, became very important because I said, I don't want to be spending my energy traveling around the world with a 50-50 situation on the work that I'm doing having a lasting impact. I want to make sure that when I plant the seed, I can nurture it, I can water it, I can, you know, soil, you know, fertilizer, everything that needs to happen for us to not just build a tree, but to build a forest. And so that was after the Dominican Republic, I decided that I wanted to, I needed to, that my calling was to come back to my home in Durham and to do the same work that I had been doing internationally at home so that I could har so that I could plant, nurture, and harvest those investments. And for me, that was about establishing roots. And we have been harvesting hella fruit. And it's been really, really beautiful work that we've been doing at Black Space, which Black Space and Beat Making Lab, they, they, they were both experiments. And it's an ever-evolving move towards the intention that I set, which was to do creative black liberation work. That was the intention. And, and Beat Making Lab was a pilot. It was a first attempt at it. There were some things that needed to be tweaked, and black space is the next phase. It is the butterfly out of that chrysalis of an ever-evolving uh, kind of practice that is based in an intention that I set. So uh, bloom where you're planted, I think, for me especially, was really, really important. Um, and, and I really feel like I'm, I'm a, I've established roots now, and I'm harvesting that fruit. So those are the lessons from my dad. Can we give him a big round of applause?
<laughs> so sometimes, you know, when people, uh, after my dad passed away, um, you know, and even when he was sick, he was diagnosed with ALS, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, and it's a disease that kind of gradually paralyzes your body, and he would, uh, people would often come up and say, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm sorry about your dad, I'm sorry for your loss, and, um, you know, I've, I've really struggled in wrestling with that idea of sorry, because... I have so much to be grateful for. He had so much to be grateful for. My dad was the ultimate optimist, like glass half full kind of guy. He was like, look, you know, I have uh, done everything I've wanted to do in my career from designing uh, schools to hosp um, uh, uh, like athletic entertainment centers. Um, to cultural spaces. I've been able to travel the world. I have wonderful family. You know, he really felt like he had done what he was called here to do. And um, though he, it would have been sweet for him to be able to stick around for another couple decades to continue to do that work, uh, he didn't leave anything on the table, on the field. He, he gave everything of himself. And when he finally laid to rest, he was grateful. He had a lot of gratitude in his heart. And it was hard to be sad dealing with a dude who was that positive. <laughs> It's like, oh, you're sorry. Okay. Well, I'm I'm grateful. I'm not happy, but I'm I, I have a lot of gratitude. Um, there's also sadness and and um, grief. Um, but when I'm when I reflect on his legacy uh, and, and everything that he's left me and left all of us uh, in the buildings that he's designed and, and in the relationships that he's built, uh, the primary feeling in my heart is gratitude. So thanks, Dad. Um, all right, so I have some more nuggets for you. Um, the best way to predict the future is to create it. I saw this on Instagram two days ago. Glam, <laughs> glam queen Chan paints. It's just a person that posts positive things on the gram and, uh, I took a screenshot of this one, and I thought it was relevant. I took the screenshot, and I said, oh, I'm going to show that. I'm going to show that on Friday. Um, <clears throat> but the best way to predict the future, so again, we're talking about black futurism, right? The best way to predict the future is to create it. Um, again, I, I, can, I will mention Harriet Tubman every 10 minutes for the rest of my life if I have to, just to drill in how significant she was. Um, she wasn't waiting to get free. She was creating it every day. That's what, that is, that is the legacy she left us, and that is the blueprint, pun intended, uh, for all of us, is every day to create and to manifest the things that, that we want to see change in this world. And the buildings and the structures and the relationships and the healing that we want to do, we can do it right here with ourselves, right here with our peers in spaces like these. Um, and we can create and manifest those things internally. And remember fractals? You do that work internally, it's going to have a fractal relationship to the rest of the universe. And so it may not feel like, you know, you breathing and chanting mantras of affirmation every day is changing the universe at a larger scale, but guess what? That's exactly what it's doing. And at the smallest level, uh, you know, we'll see that change at the biggest, uh, on the biggest platforms. So uh, I wanted to show you just some footage. I guess I kinda, I did this out of order a little bit. Uh, I told you about Beat Making Lab. Now I'm gonna just show you a little clip of, uh, of what that work was about. Um, I don't know how to control volume, but that's fine. So this is in the Congo. So the music that you're hearing was produced by the kids that we were mentoring. Yeah. 
So, uh, can I get my sound people, can you just keep the video going but mute the audio? Or just bring it down super low? That'd be great. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so this was Beat Making Lab again uh, in these different community centers. Uh, the first one you saw was in the Congo. This one was in Panama uh, during a festival called the Festival de los Diablos y Congos, uh, which was about the Simarones runaway slaves and the enclaves and, and the resistance that they had against uh, the Spanish colonizers. It was a really beautiful program. Uh, this is in Senegal, and again, and the clips go all the way through Fiji, and uh, and I think it stops with Ethiopia with this particular clip. Um, but these were this was that first round of, of seed planting, and. Uh, Again, as I've already explained, um, but now you'll be able to see visually, it was very important for me to come back to Durham, back to my home, and to plant those seeds uh, in the community that nurtured me and gave me so much sauce. Um, so this is now a clip of, of uh, and also the other cool thing about Black Space is, um, though with Beat Making Lab, it was primarily music based, uh, one of our mantras at Black Space is, by any medium necessary. All right, by any medium necessary. So we do puppetry, we do coding, you know, we do music, of course, which is my background. Uh, but I wanted to show you a brief clip from Black Space. You can turn the volume back up. Welcome to Black Space. We are an Afrofuturism digital makerspace based right here in downtown Durham, North Carolina. We do beats, we do emceeing, we do poetry, we do 3D printing, we do digital storytelling, and we need your help. Afrofuturism is about merging technology, creativity, and entrepreneurship. Black Space is not your typical STEM program. We do culturally relevant STEAM curriculum centering art and centering people of color who are underrepresented in tech. It's like pretty dope and you don't really see that too often around Durham. Black space, and this is like the first place that I've actually felt like I found a family outside of my home. I went home and I couldn't wait to come back. I find it empowering and, and amazing. Uh, you should fund Durham and Black Space's Afro Future because we are bringing the youth to a whole new level with skill sets that have not been brought anywhere else within this area. Cool, so... <clears throat> That's a little bit about Black Space. If you're interested in learning more or becoming a sustainer, because we do need sustaining, sustaining donors, you can just uh, check us out at theblackspace.org. Um, so that was, uh, again, um, building on the models that were established with uh, Beat Making Lab. Black Space became um, a, a, a different uh, strategy towards the goal of, of doing creative um, black liberation work and community artivism, um, merging the worlds of, of art and activism, which is what led me to uh, something that I was asked to, to mention in my remarks today, which is the role that I've played uh, locally in North Carolina uh, getting into politics. Um, so I ran for mayor in 2017 and uh, I'm currently running for state senate uh, in North Carolina. Yeah, thank you. 
And um, you know, my campaign manager told me to tell y'all to take out your phones and follow me on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, okay, yeah, it's just Pierce Freeline. You can follow me. You don't got. I'm not asking for no money, um, but yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, but right now, um, yeah, just, and, and you mentioned some of the campaign principles, some of the platform that we developed, community, growth, youth, and love, and people would always ask, well, how is love like a, a campaign platform? I said, how is love not a campaign platform? It's certainly something we need more of. Thank you. It's certainly something that I think we need a, a lot more of, love as accountability, love as empathy, and, and we tied in different um, uh, policy platforms, especially around police accountability as an extension of love for the community, of love, of love for black people. You know, we tie that in um, because it's important. Um, so we're still working on my campaign, my Senate campaign kind of just launched recently. Uh, we don't have a video for it yet, but I did just want to show you a brief clip from uh, my mayoral, my mayoral campaign. Uh, really coincides with a, a poem by Maya Angelou. Uh, she talks about um, building clean, clean and well-furnished well schools, safe and non-threatening streets, employment which makes use of your talents but does not degrade your dignity. You're the best we have. My name is Pierce Freelon, and I'm running for mayor of the city of Durham, North Carolina. That's one of those cute grandkids. <laughs> I'm a father. I'm raising kids in this community. Okay, cool. You don't have to watch the whole thing. Um, <laughs> But um, for me, uh, you know, again, setting the intention uh, to do this very important work led me very naturally into politics. And, um, you know, waking up in November of 2016 um, really had me thinking about what my obligations were to create the world that we want. I looked around, I didn't see candidates that reflected my values, I didn't see any millennials involved in politics at the national level, and then I was like, well, who is at the local level? Nobody. Who is in the city council? Our, the median age in our city council when I was running for mayor in 2017 was 63 years old. That's the median age, meaning we had several people in their 70s and, you know, there was just, we were completely unrepresented. And so I said, well, what, what are we going to do about that? What are we going to do about that? You know, and so we brought our team together. We did some uh, community dialogues around things, ar bl around black futurism. What type of future do we want to see for the city of Durham, for the state of North Carolina? And we put it all in our platform and we ran. And we ran hard. And we didn't win. Um, did not win. I'm not the mayor of Durham. Um, <laughs> But uh, interestingly enough, we, we laid the foundation for this state Senate run, and we're going to win this one. So, pretty sh So, and, uh, and I know we're going to win, because I'm, I, you know, I have your support. And, um, but also, real talk, like, I, I'm all about manifesting that. Um, you know, we have all the tools that we need in the foundation uh, to win. So I was going to show you a clip from History of White People, but you just showed me the five minute sign. Uh, so it's all good. It's all good. I know we started a little late, so we're cutting it a bit short. Also, I threw in some random, like, let's talk about our intentions. That was probably cooler than History of White People anyway. Um, <laughs> but I'll just, well, well, they're telling me to show it. Uh, but I have other things I want to talk about with my last five minutes. Um, how about this? Uh, I'll play the first minute, and uh, and then um, you can uh, cut the volume, and then you, they can watch the visuals while I close out. Okay, cool. You, that's what's up. They like me in the booth. Okay. <laughs> so this is the first uh, the first minute of his. Oop, sorry. Boom, boom. Go back. Oh, right, because it, it takes a minute to boot up, right? So, okay, yeah, I'll just be quiet. <laughs> hey, you, Caucasian, 
Caveman. Oh, hey, Blanco. Gringo. Pale, Pale face. face. I gotta tell you a secret. Hulk. Mzungu. This might come as a surprise, but uh, white people, listen to this. Uh-huh. In America in the early 1600s, you didn't exist. You didn't exist? I hate to break it to you like this. Listen to what your history books missed. What would be made white were completely unrelated, under-melanated people. Frankenstein. Collaged by an optical illusion. The ultimate mirage called race. A social construction like Santa Claus. Back in the day, y'all either English or Scott. Irish Catholic or Protestant, land owning or not. But you can't have white without black in America. Back before we was Captain America, black wasn't a race. Africans came from different nations, like in Dongo, where Queen Nzinga reigned. Indigenous were the same. Pohatan, Doeg, regardless of tribe, melanin didn't determine fate. Skin color didn't make a difference, no matter what hue your flesh was tinted in. Cause your complexion wasn't kinship, and pigment was insignificant. It didn't prevent you from certain privileges. This is the story of how skin became color. Color became race, and race became power. The creation of the Caucasian, white Aryan. It's the story of how white became American. The census says your race is white. Don't believe the hype. 1650, Jamestown. Meet William Berkeley, appointed by King Charles II of England to govern colonial Virginia. He rules with an iron hand and enriches a small cadre of English landowners. They grow tobacco, and the sweet leaf is gold, America's first road to riches. Okay, so um, the re- it's about seven minutes long, this first episode. It's kind of reads like a musical documentary. Uh, we talk about how William Berkeley. Um, basically uh, creates the white race in the early uh, in the late 1600s following Bacon's rebellion which was a rebellion of black or sorry black didn't exist yet of african uh, irish scottish and poor english working class folks who were fighting against the british um, this multiracial coalition of poor people was something that really threatened the British crown. And so in order to keep them from finding solidarity with one another, they, they created a law. It's the first law in the history of this country where the word white or uh, Negro was used to de- describe a human being. And, uh, and that was an anti-miscegenation law to prevent white people from marrying Indians or mulattoes or Negroes. Um, so this is the history of, um, of how that law came to be. And it's part of a 16-part series where we talk about the ways in which race has been uh, changed and manipulated and, and ebbed and flowed and grown and swelled over the years. Uh, and it goes straight from uh, 1650 to the present. Um, so this series is, um, I think really as much as running for mayor or founding black space, uh, aligned with what we talked about at the very beginning with Sankofa. It's so important if you think about, you know, one of the things history of white people in America teaches us is that race is a thing that somebody thought up and they thought of it with a particular intention in mind to keep poor people from finding solidarity amongst themselves and collectively rebelling against the elite. That is why race was created and that is why it's still here. And, but the important lesson to take from that is not only, cause you know, I hate when people just say, oh, race is a social construct, it's not real. It is very real because we're dealing with the consequences of this social construct in a very real way. But the beauty of knowing the history, of looking back to the past of where this comes from, is that somebody made it up, and guess what? We also have the capacity to make our own reality moving forward and to shape and to craft and to manifest a different kind of future. And that is exactly why spaces like these are so necessary so necessary. But as we learn with Sankofa, you know, as we move forward, we need to look back and to understand the history, the legacy, uh, the legacy of wrongdoing, the legacy of um, trauma, 
But you know, the, a lot of people talk about healing ancestral wounds and dealing with ancestral trauma. We also inherit, and we do inherit those things, and we do need to do that healing work. But we also inherit ancestral knowledge, wisdom, power, resiliency. When I heard the Trinidad, whoop, whoop, that's, that's an ancestral legacy that we've inherited. Black people everywhere, you shout out their hood, they get hyped. That's a blackity black thing. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Our dap, our language, our, you know, sauce is something that is completely unique to our people. And it's something that's been exploited in this country for a lot of money. They made an industry out of it. They've tried to commodify it. They can't come out. We too magic. We can't be contained. You like that? <laughs> You know, but uh, it's important to channel that towards uh, the things that we want to manifest. So in closing, just three more quotes. I have so many quotes. Uh, Lead with love, which is a, a repeat from earlier. I first heard from Dr. Margaret Brunson. Um, All organizing is science fiction. All right, Harriet Tubman. All organizing is science fiction. When she said, we about to get free, people were looking at her like, what you mean? <laughs> How? Harriet. <laughs> but she was on another, she was on a whole nother vibe. She was ahead of her time, you know, because Sankofa, she was able to look forward. Yeah, you got it. Okay. So Adrian Marie Brown, Walida Imarisha, e. two wonderful uh, movement workers. Uh, Adrian Marie Brown's book, um, Emergent Strategy, is an absolute must read for every black futurist. Um, and Walida Imarisha um, has a great novel out. She also speaks Klingon, um, which I just, it's so cool. Uh, and then my dad's quote, we're gonna end with this one. Art is the most powerful force in the universe. So for all my designers out there, all my architects, all my graphic artists, visual, whatever the medium is, we have the power. Uh, so let's use it. Thank you. We'd like to thank you so much for sharing your powerful vision, your energy, and your voice. What a privilege it's been for you to kick off this weekend. And everyone, thank you for being here. You all have been such a marvelous audience. We look forward to sharing all that is in store for the next two days. And following up, we hope you will join us uh, now for Beer and Dogs, a tradition here at the GSD, which happens every Friday. There will be food, socializing, dancing, and the porticos until 8 p.m. Enjoy your evening, get your rest, and we'll see you tomorrow at 8 for registrations and breakfast. Thank you.